Yeah, just if the slides don't load, it's Google's fault, okay? Uh, so, I've tried to make two jokes. This is the first one. It's like swapping the words space and sound around. So, you know, you, you quite often come across these things on the radio where they've sonified, uh, you know, some sort of star system or something. And it always just sounds a bit like... Oh, he's like, oh, great, okay. So I'm not interested in that. Uh, but I like sounds a bit like that. But the, the idea is that instead of looking at sonifying space, uh, we're looking at the space of sound. Uh, so it, this talk is all about different perspectives on the space of possible sounds that we might be interested in. Okay, so this is my sort of... I, I was trying to work out when I started getting interested in sort of space and what, what's, what's going on. Not the, you know, spaceship type of space, but the uh, space, abstract spaces. So this book's amazing. It came out in 1993, I think, and I, I was studying uh, genetics and zoology at the time at Leeds University. Uh, so I, I switched disciplines to computer science later. And this book is all about, it's like an early... A classic work on systems biology and complexity and evolution so uh, which sounds cool but that and right now that's like that's what it's all about that's what biology is all about uh, but back then that was quite fresh and um, there's a nice quote here so theories of adaptive walks in rugged landscapes are likely to find practical appliances in the near future uh, I like that quote just because uh, the near future is in the next like seven minutes of this talk. So that you're going to find out what, what sort of practical applications I've found for uh, walking around in rugged landscapes. So what does it mean? So you've got a picture down there. There's a space for you. It's like a three-dimensional space. And the concept is that uh, in terms of evolution, you know, that we're moving around a species which is evolving, is moving around in that space. And depending where it is, uh, it looks different, right? So think of, um, I don't know, butterflies. And in different places in that space, a butterfly will look different. Okay, so as the species evolves over time, it looks different. And the higher up it is, the better a butterfly, the better it is at being a butterfly. Okay, uh, so that's the idea that, that what a species is doing when it's evolving is essentially moving around this space. And if it happens to climb up a mountain, uh, then it becomes really successful. And that's the basics of, of evolution. But it becomes really interesting when you think about what the, what the structure of that space is and how things move around it. So there was a guy, a Japanese researcher called uh, Kimura as well, I think, who was around uh, back then. And he talked about neutral spaces and the idea that species, there might just be a kind of um, walkway between two mountains that it goes along. It doesn't get any better or worse. It just kind of, it's like a neutral drift. And there was this idea that things are drifting around. So it was kind of a bit anti-Darwinian. It's like Darwin makes you think, oh, things are getting better all the time. But sometimes they're just aimlessly wandering around in, in this space. Okay, so that's one aspect of the space. But of course, this is just... Um, you know, a 2D space. So in that, what we're saying by putting a butterfly in a 2D space is saying a butterfly only has two characteristics. And this is when it blew my mind, is the idea that it's not just 2D, it's like hundreds of D. So if you think about the characteristics of a human being and how successful they may or may not be, or whatever, or how interesting they are, whatever you want to say about them, uh, then suddenly you've got a massive list of characteristics. And what that means is you don't have a 3D space anymore. You've got a massive, inconceivably complicated space to explore. So in, in the reality is that actually when we're exploring these spaces, that we're exploring extremely high dimensional spaces that we can't even imagine. And uh, so I'll talk more about that and why we need AI to do that later. But uh, yeah, now there's one other aspect of this that Kaufman opened up to my mind, my young mind uh, at university, which was that not only are these spaces uh, extremely high dimensional and thus we can't even possibly imagine them, um, they're also dynamic. <laughs> so they actually change. So as you move around the space, of course, you're not the only species. There are other species. And if another species gets... Uh, competing with you improves in a kind of arms race kind of scenario, then suddenly the whole space changes because the thing you used to do that allowed you to be successful no longer works. So it's like this crazy dynamic space with um, you know, all these different species impacting each other's fitness landscapes. And yeah, so that was my mind blown. That's where I started. And I was like, yeah, that's cool. Um, so, but I came back to it a little bit later uh, with, um, the slide doesn't go forward, hang on, plan B. Yeah, I came back to it a bit later uh, when I encountered um, a Richard Dawkins 
example called Biomorphs, which he developed as part of the Blind Watchmaker book. Uh, and essentially what he was trying to say was, um, hey, creationists, you know you're saying that it's impossible for anything complicated to arise from evolution. How could that ever happen? It must have been God that made everything. Uh, he said, actually, no, how about if I write a really simple computer program that can generate incredibly complicated things really easily, and then you'll have to be quiet, won't you? Uh, and that, that's obviously Dawkins speaking there, uh, not me. I mean, uh, there may or may not be a God. Who knows? Who cares? Um, so, um, but suffice to say that biomorphs work, and you can make really complicated things with just a few steps. And it's like an interactive thing. So it's a bit like dog breeding. You know, you go, okay, I like the look of that sort of mosquito-looking thing in the top of the middle there. I'm going to cross that with the weird, um, you know, 500 million-year-old weird thing down there. And then what am I going to get? So it's the idea of kind of breeding form, okay? So um, fast forward through uh, doing lots of music and uh, hanging out with people and, and putting records out and stuff. And I was like, what, what, what about if I did this with sound? And so that's where, in, in, the, in 2000, so I was doing a you know, MSc at the time, and I was studying evolution, how evolution theory can be kind of implemented in a computer and then used to evolve anything that you want. Uh, and I decided that I would evolve sounds. So this system here, let's see if we can get it to work. Uh, here we go. Here we go. Yeah, so what we've got here is basically a sound version of uh, biomorphs. And uh, so what you can do is you can, so I, I implemented it first in like tw 20 years ago and then redid it in, in the new web technology of the day, which is JavaScript uh, a few years back. Anyway. Okay, oh, I quite like that one. So what I can do is if I like that one, I can kind of select it and then get kind of variations of it. So all these red ones are basically variations on that funny one that we have there. Oh, that's not going to do very well in life, is it? Well, maybe it's silent and very philosophical, I don't know. But anyway, so the idea is that you can basically move through this complicated space. So thinking about the space I was talking about earlier, so how big is the space? Uh, anyone want to guess how many dimensions there are in this space? <laughs> so you can see the phenotype there. You can see the sort of synth that we're listening to there. That's what it looks like. So you can see it's got... Um, a load of sort of weird, not used bits, very similar to humans. We've got a load of junk DNA, although these days they don't believe in junk DNA anymore. It's now part of the regulation system of your genetic material. But anyway, we've got junk DNA down there. Real junk DNA doesn't do anything. And so those are all oscillators. And then we've got some more in the middle and they're kind of wired together. And that's what we're listening to. And so each of these has, I think, something like 14 parameters. So if you times the number of boxes, you can see by 14, that's how, dimen how high dimensional this space is. So just by making you know, a kind of modular synth type of thing, suddenly we've got this insanely huge space that we can't possibly conceive, which is pretty cool. Uh, so that's, that, that was exciting. Uh, but the problem, problem with it is that um, you... Um, yeah, oh, let's not go to the problem yet. Problem next. Uh, what's the space of possible sounds? Okay, so I just did mention that a bit. Uh, so how, how can we maybe sort of investigate the space a bit? Uh, so what I've got here is a recording of 15 minutes of me using this system and just like moving through the space. And this is a spectrogram representation. And it's okay, but it doesn't really... I mean, I look at that and I don't really know... It doesn't look like that nice diagram we had on the Kaufman slide. It doesn't really tell me like how big the space is and what I'm doing. So uh, here's, here's some inspiration for how we might do it better. So there's a, a sort of history in, in uh, music, psychology, literature of trying to map out the space of possible timbres for instruments. So what we can see here are sort of some instruments like mapped out into space. Uh, obviously, if the timbre of an instrument is high dimensional. It might be just a recording of it that's on all the numbers that represent that recording, or it might be something else. But suffice to say, it's not 2D like these diagrams are. So we use a, what we call a dimensional reduction technique to go from high D, like in the case of the, my big synth, um, you know, like hundreds of D down to like 2 or 3D, so that we can plot it and look at it. Okay, so that's how people do it in, in the literature. So I thought, oh, I'll have a crack at that. Uh, I'll do that. And I mean, so what, what can we interpret from here? So you could, you know, think about uh, where French horn sort of about, actually, so what that tells me is the violin sounds more like the French horn than the clarinet does. Okay, fair enough. And this is based on human ratings of how close things are. So this is the absolute truth. 
kind of empirical anyway. Uh, right, so um, anyway, so I got that 15-minute session, and then actually I got a 15-minute session of me using a friend's modular synth as a sort of counter example, so because uh, comparing Evo synth to a, a modular, like an analog thing with cables, and sort of plotted them both on the same graph to see, you know, what, what, what kind of space was I exploring. And you can see, I think the top cluster, all those things, all the square ones are modular synth, and all the round ones are Evo synth. So what that tells me is when I was working on the modular synth, I was not exploring as much space as I was when I was working with Evo synth. That doesn't mean it's better or anything. It probably means that it's harder to unplug things on a modular synth and get somewhere else than it is to, you know, click a button on a screen and jump somewhere quite far. Anyway, so that's, that's a way of thinking about the space, possible sounds for a, uh, a synth. But, um, okay, so I've, you, you'll notice I've got a slightly cheesy space theme going. Uh, so this is Voyager, you know, a kind of automatic probe that flew off and just exited from the solar system a couple of years back, I think. Anyway, so what, it, what about if we wanted to explore this incredibly complicated space automatically? So it's quite, ch it's quite hard work to kind of keep working through this big space and find all the good stuff. What about where are all the hidden gems in that space? You know, there might be whole areas of Evo synth space that nobody's explored yet, even though I think a couple of hundred people have used it and, and like uploaded synths to it and stuff, but still, you know, so, th so this really fascinated me as well. So the idea that you can get something like, um, you know, a synth like this, uh, like the, the DX7 J Yamaha uh, 1983, uh, you know, synth, but really hard to program. It just had this horrible little two-liner display and it's really difficult to program. And uh, then there's an emulator of it there just show. I mean, who wants to deal with that? You know, nobody. It's, it's boring. It's terrible. Um, it's impossible to program. Uh, so... But there might be hidden gems in the space of possible sounds that this thing can make. And, and so how do we find them? You know, what, so the idea is to sort of think about ways of exploring the space automatically. Uh, uh, so, um, yeah, is anyone familiar with this one? This is um, a thing called uh, MIDI Mutant, which uh, Aphex Twin and Dave Griffiths, who's, who's, they're both obviously brilliant, uh, did. And basically it, it does that. So it allows you, it sort of automatically explores the space of possible sounds for a Yamaha FM synthesizer. So it's like a Raspberry Pi in a box that kind of sends um, different sounds to the, to the synth and then listens to them and tries to get it to sound like a, get the sound that you want. Now, if we're lucky, uh, maybe my internet's working now. Let's see if we can play that one because it's quite cool. Uh, give it a go. Yeah? Go on. Yeah, there we go. Here it is. You kind of get the idea. So that that's um that's uh, that's the uh, MIDI mutant kind of exploring the space of possible sounds uh, for for that. Uh, so I'm just gonna, oops. And so that's great, but um, the problem with exploring the space of possible sounds is it's huge, as I was talking about earlier. So it's got, um, what did I say? Uh, oh, I've lost the slide. Um, it's got like 100 and something, 130 parameters. And so it's, there's like six operators and 130 parameters in total. So it's 100. So the parameter space is 130D, and it's dynamic as well. Just like the butterflies, uh, it changes. So if you change one parameter, then the space kind of changes for the other one. So what, I what this graph shows is in the middle point, you know, you, you've got the slider in the middle, and then as you gradually move it, it's kind of showing you how far away you get in the sound. So you can see it's kind of bumpy and difficult. So that that kind of space is difficult for a um, for an algorithm to search. Uh, but luckily. Um, uh, we did something that was better than uh, Richard's one. Um, and this is what we, we built. I worked with uh, one of my uh, students to develop, uh, sort of redevelop some of the work I did in my PhD. And th this thing is basically a deep network. It's actually a deep bi-directional um, long short-term memory network with highway layers, uh, which is kind of a fancy kind of neural network. And it works quite well. So this can actually learn how to program a uh, DX7, so you can basically say, "Give me here's a sound I want," and it will go, "Okay," and then actually real time, uh, which is better than that one, which isn't, and um, it will give you the preset basically for the sound that makes the sound you want, and that graph says that what I just said is true. Uh, okay, <laughs> <laughs> so moving on, and that it's better than their system. Okay, that's what graphs are for. 
I'm correct and they're, they're worse than me. That's what computer science graphs are for, so I don't like them. Um, anyway, so they're a bit macho, whatever. Uh, so anyway, so this image here is my next, my final phase. I'm probably using too much time here, sorry. Yeah, okay. So my final sort of thing about space. So we've done, we've seen, you know, the space, sort of illustrating and exploring the space and then exploring the space automatically. Uh, but what about sharing the space? And what about being guided through the space by uh, an AI, um, a co-creative AI? So instead of it just being this machine that you kind of say, right, go and find this thing, and off it goes, finds it, and then you're done, it's more of a kind of co-creative cre co partner. And this is what we're kind of, uh, this is another thread of my work, and also something that that's, uh, we're doing now. Uh, so this image here shows, uh, you've got Finn Peters, who's a Saxon flute player I've worked with a lot on the left there, and he's and all these computers, uh, this is one of these workshops where everyone has to write an algorithm that plays music to a live, with a live musician. So, so these, each computer took it in turn to play live with Finn. They did an improvisation so at Cafe Otto, I think. And uh, yeah, it's a great, great night. And uh, so that's the kind of stuff we've been doing. And um, yeah, so how, how do we do it? Well, uh, let me just play you one of my systems, if I can get that to play. I'm just going to see if we can do that. I just want to play some sound. Yeah. So this is an example of one of these systems that was running on one of those laptops, which may or may not play. Here we go. <laughs> So you get the idea. So that's basically Martin Speak on the saxophone in that case, uh, improvising with you know an AI thing. Uh, although it's showing me operating a sort of mixer, I was just turning it up and then I walked away. So it's annoying that they put that photo in. It should have just been a picture of the mixer and the, the synth and then a computer, because that's what did all the playing. Um, but anyway, so this thing, we, we ran it live. Uh, it sort of got broadcast on BBC's Jazz, Jazz on Jazz Lineup, I think it was. So that's the... That's the, that's, that's the fun part when you do these kind of high stakes things where if it breaks, you look really stupid. So it's kind of makes, it, it makes it better. Uh, but anyway, so, and I'm really interested to know how the interaction goes, you know, not just, because there's a history in, in computer music of doing things like this and uh, just going, oh yeah, there's my system, write up the system and move on. But I'm really interested in sort of better understanding what went on in that interaction. So what you can see in the top right there, we got the recording of it, so the recording up there, and then three people kind of went and annotated the performance to say what they what they were in experiencing and what they thought was going on. One of the people was me, because I wrote the algorithm. Another one was Martin, who because he was playing along, so he was kind of saying, oh, the, the system seemed to be doing this, so I did this. So it's kind of reflecting on, on what he was doing in reaction to it. And then uh, a sort of we can do a kind of qualitative analysis to try and pull out tags, like a grounded theory type of thing, if anyone's familiar with that, of like, just describing what went on in those kind of comments. Uh, and so ne next, now we're looking at, we're sort of pulling out this idea that sharing information seems to help with these interactions because, the, you know, how does the AI kind of expose some of its internal state? And, you know, whenever you work with people, humans in, in a team, it's really important to share information and know what people are doing, what people are capable of, that sort of thing, so that you can achieve your goals. So we've kind of gone into a bit of this kind of management theory and stuff in this, but for, to find out about teams. But So this is the first kind of experiment in that area. So what we try to do is basically train a neural network to play a drum kit and then get it to improvise along with someone. And but it would say how confident it was about what it was doing and whether it was a good match for what the, the, the guy was playing. Uh, so we did this with some colleagues in Monash. And uh, yeah, so this, was, uh, this is the newest thing we're doing, I guess. And so we're trying to build out these kind of systems and add little communication devices on them so people know what the system's trying to do or what, 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 what it thinks you're doing, things like that. So this is the new stuff. Uh, and um, yeah, so I've... I've, I've put an advert up for our research project. So a lot of these ideas, we're trying to kind of make them accessible. It's really important that people can 
not just see me talking about it and everything seems to work. And then you go and look at the code and nothing does anything, which is quite a common experience I've had with a lot of these systems. So what we want to do with Mimic is, is really, put, we've got a website, we've got loads of systems on there that you can interact with, and the code's all there so you can hack around with it. So that's, that's the idea of Mimic, uh, and just to get people working with, with, with AI in a creative kind of context. So there's lots of examples. So go and have a look at that website. Uh, that's our project. And um, yeah, I'm done. So thanks for listening. I, re I really like your idea of the, um, the, the multi-dimensional space of evolution. But to be truly accurate, you'd have to think of a number of chance elements, like Jupiter was once in a place that it directed asteroids towards the Earth, which were full of ice, which gave us the oceans. Um, also, you can be on a evolutionary plane or a gradient or whatever and do quite well and then a massive asteroid will come and wipe you out. So uh, maybe maybe introducing those things might be quite interesting. Absolutely, yeah. So, so that's the idea of, of it, the space is not fixed, it's dynamic and it depends on other factors, right? So, or another... Or, or some, suddenly an, a giant elephant might be born that we'd never seen before and it just destroys your habitat uh, and it's called Donald Trump or something, you know, and whatever. And, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Other things affect your fitness landscape and your... So, yeah, no, that's really a good point and very interesting. Thanks. Hi. Um, have you used any sort of reinforcement learning uh, techniques? You seem to have, like, a kind of evaluation of whether something's doing well or not. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the agent itself can can tell whether it's doing well or not, but does does it get any feedback from who it's playing with? Yeah. So there's uh, so in one of the systems, the speak system, there's a kind of implicit reinforcement learning in the sense that it kind of it is listening to the patterns that he's generating and kind of generating similar patterns. It's sort of a continuator of sorts, if, if you know that work. But it's I guess. If it, 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 the expectation is that the musician is probably going to kind of join in and make similar patterns, so it kind of reinforces its model. But th there's no there's no explicit reinforcement learning algorithm in there. Uh, with the the Monash system, uh, the drummer, uh, it's it's uh, it's a tr it's a pre-trained neural network, uh, so it's not actively reinforcing. But I know I know Nick Collins did some work with reinforcement learning, and um, yeah, sort of. Basically, the, the system would listen to what was going on, and if, if its things were played by the musician, then those things would get more weight, so it would be more likely to play them again, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Would you consider, sorry, second question, uh, would you consider this like an agent or just an algorithm which can generate sounds? Like, how, like, what, how do you. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, so is, does it have agency? Uh, yeah, so. So I work quite a lot with uh, uh, Professor Mark D'Inverno, who's sort of, he wrote a lot of early papers on, on multi-agent systems. And he, he, you can talk to him all day about the definition of an agent. But it, so, it's, so I think there's, in computer science, an agent has a specific definition, or, or a couple of them that people argue about, uh, and where it has a certain set of goals which it's, that it's working towards that are explicitly defined, and it has a certain set of understandings of the world and how and how it can in, sort of enact things on the world and, and achieve things. So that that's one model of, of agency, and we haven't explicitly modelled that in, in the agent, if you would call it an agent. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's certainly it's doing stuff of its own accord. It's kind of it's quite responsive in a sense rather than doing stuff itself because it waits for things to be played and then kind of carries on. But yeah, no, yeah, agency. 